Good afternoon. My name is John Bennett, and I want to thank you all very, very much for being here today. Um, few who live through this summer, and by the way, I can't see a thing, so I'm, I'm talking to you blind. <laughs> few who live through this summer in the uh, basalt El Jebel area will ever forget it. And this forum should be a great opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of what happened and what it means to all of us going forward. Uh, and we have a wonderful group of presenters today to help us do just that. But first, it's a pleasure to introduce the Operations and Resources Director of the Aspen Community Foundation, Valerie Carlin. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Tamara Tromolin, our Executive Director, is unable to join us on the stage this evening, so you're stuck with me. Um, I have the great pleasure of welcoming you all to the temporary for the first Changing Face of Wildfire Forum. It's been three months since the late Christine fire ignited, opening our eyes to the havoc and devastation a wildfire can inflict on our community. Of course, we know that wildfires are a threat during the summer, and many of us recall the fires, large and small, that have burned in our valley over the years. But watching Basalt Mountain go up in flames, however, brought home the magnitude of the danger we face. We are fortunate that, due to the vigilant and heroic efforts of firefighters and other first responders, the damage was not more extensive and no lives were lost. In addition, the immediate generosity and quick, compassionate response from the community was so heartening, so many stepped in with the offers of support and a true testament to the can-do attitude of this valley. Ever since Hurricane Katrina, Aspen Community Foundation has channeled local funding to help communities impacted by natural disasters. We know what it's like to provide funding for disaster relief and recovery. Lake Christine showed us what it actually means to be involved in disaster relief and recovery. We learned that funding is important, especially for the immediate relief and long-term recovery efforts. But more importantly, we learned that we must be prepared for the next one. So over these next three days, the Changing Face of Wildfire Forums are an opportunity to bring together the Valley community, individuals, families, schools, nonprofits, businesses, civic groups, government agencies, to learn, to prepare, and to plan, to help us be the best position we can possibly be to help mitigate the effects of the next fire that strikes our community. So thank you all for being here this evening. Thanks, Valerie. Our first speaker this afternoon is Scott Fitzwilliams, who will share his thoughts on why we're here and the bullet we just dodged. Uh, Scott knows both topics. He is forest super supervisor for the 2.4 million acre White River National Forest. And like others you'll hear from this afternoon, he had a busy, hot summer. Please join me in welcoming Scott Fitzwilliams. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, John. Thanks. Thanks to the Aspen Community Foundation for organizing this. Very timely, for sure, while it's still fresh in our mind. John asked me to talk about why we're here, and, and I, I began to contemplate that a little bit, and I realized what really came to me was we're here, at least in my thoughts, are because this fire was not an anomaly. It was not a surprise to me. It wasn't something that is we should look at as, you know, a hundred year event. Um, hopefully the, com the, com the immediate community never has to deal with it again. But it's really made me think about um, what we need to do as communities, as agencies, as um, f at all levels, local, state, and federal, to help communities prepare better. Because I think, frankly, we haven't been. We're entering, um, we're finishing up, if fire season ever ends. We, we've changed the term from fire season to fire year um, throughout the country. We're, we're again going to send a, set another record nationwide uh, um, for wildfires, both in costs, acres, damage, you name it. And um, it's really made me think about where we are as a community, where we are as an agency, and what we need to do to move forward. Like I said, this wasn't an anomaly. Um, tragic, terrifying for many of us that were right there on July 4th. I never seen anything like it, and there's going to be people who are going to talk more about that. But we're here because 
of not some random event, tragic and, and someone making some bad choices about shooting on the shooting range, but um, it could be any other way. Uh, and, and I think there are three things, and we're going to hear from um, other speakers about what's driving this. Why is it, is, are, are we seeing what we're seeing? And, and I look at it, and there are three things that are really driving what's going on across the West in Colorado and here in the Roaring Fork Valley. We have a fuels problem. We have too many trees in the Air Mountain region. We probably have 40 times the stocking rate in the inner mountain areas, that's you know Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Arizona, than we did 150 years ago. Smoky Bear did too good of job. We have, we have suppressed fires to the point where we have fuels that are just um, unbearable. Secondly, um, we've made some choices in society, and we're seeing it every day in Colorado, where we build our homes. Over 20 million homes have been built in the wildland urban interface in the West. Um, so that makes these folks who fight fires job much more difficult, much more costly, and much more dangerous. And finally, we have a climate that's going crazy. Um, I don't really care how you think it happened, but it's happening. And, and what causes it, I don't care. Um, we can debate that in another arena, but um, we have a climate that's, that's changing. Um, we're hotter, we're drier, um, and, and those three factors are really driving the wildland fire issue across the West, and it's not going away. So we need to be more prepared. We need to be, um, we need to do better planning as communities, and, and I hope we get a chance at the end of, towards the end of this talk about what we can do and how we should approach this. We, we also need to, to recognize where we live and that fire has been part of the ecology of where we live today for 10,000 years or thereabouts. We've got to learn more about that. We've got to accept it more. People come to all the time, put them out, put them out, or just get you know, order some more aircraft, or why didn't you put it out sooner? That's how we got here, was putting out fires when they're at every smoke. We've got to accept um, not less fires. We need to accept more fires, managed in a way that we can, they're tolerable, that, that's acceptable, but we have, to, we have to begin to realize we live in a fire-dependent ecosystem, and that's not changing. Um, we need to, you know, really look at, at from a community perspective, um, you know, our, our development planning. And not that we can't build houses. We've just got to plan the little things that make it easier when we do have a fire. Um, and, and so those are things that I think we have to look at as a community, not just an individual agency or a planning commission. It has to be across the board. Fires are not going away. Um, they, they're here um, for as long as we're going to be here. And, and so what we have to do, and what, what I think our, our, our challenges in the future is, how we're going to live with them, how we're going to manage them, and what each of us are going to do individually to, to make um, the situations when there is a fire a little better. Um, we have to choose how we interact with fire. Um, we have to choose, uh, you know, and, and accept some of the, the maybe consequences of fire. Um, when we, you know, when we have fires and when, when we're looking at um, the landscape, we're always determining, is this an opportunity for us to, to, to maybe let fire take its natural role? And most of the time, it's the social things that force us or encourage us to put those fires out sooner than maybe we should. And so we've got we uh, collectively have to learn to interact with fire a little better. And we have to accept the responsibility, accept the, frankly, the, the, um, the short-term, I believe, um, setbacks that, that sometimes fire brings. It might result in certain areas being closed or it might result in some smoke in the air for a few days here and there. But it's, it's not going away. And no matter how much we spend, this year we're going to spend close to $3 billion in the Forest Service on fire suppression. And I think if you add CAL FIRE, that's another billion. Um, and the other agencies, it's, it's a $5 billion um, hit to the taxpayer. 
And we've got to look at those three factors I mentioned earlier and figure out, well, we, the climate one's pretty hard to, to adjust at the least in short term, but how can we deal with the fuels and how can we deal with where we're building our houses? Some folks are gonna talk after me that are gonna get into some details that I think you'll really enjoy and it'll be really informative. So thanks for allowing me to be here and look forward to hearing the rest of the show. Thanks, Scott. We really value uh, your perspective on the fact that this is an issue that's not going away um, and a reminder that it's neither an anomaly uh, nor is the answer simply putting every fire out. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Gary Ferguson, who will give us an overview of the age of fire, life in the land of flames. Uh, Gary is a National Geographic science writer and author of over 25 books on nature and science, including Land on Fire, the New Reality of Wildfire in the West. Gary has won many awards for his writing, including a new one he's receiving tomorrow morning in Denver. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for joining us. It's such a, an honor to be here and to be with this level of expertise. What I'm going to share with you, I got from hanging out with good sound people, resource managers, firefighters like these. And so I'm in some ways just the messenger. Before I get started, though, I want to also say this is hard stuff. My wife, Dr. Mary Claire, is here today, and she's worked over many years with compassion fatigue, with firefighters and others, as well as people grieving conditions in their lives and communities that cause a lot of stress. This causes a lot of stress. Take care of yourselves and be kind to yourselves. You've got elevated cortisol levels, a lot of us do, all over the West. We live in Montana. And this is the, the reality of our lives that's really causing a tremendous amount of anxiety and even depression. So take care of each other. And uh, I, I do want to at least acknowledge and honor the fact that but beyond all the practical things we can do to make our communities safer, and there are quite a few, I think we also need to be... Um, uh, aware that we more than ever need to take care of ourselves and, and each other. So with that said, this is a shot um, of the 416 fire near Durango, and you've seen lots of shots of fire this year. Fire is a very healthy thing for the forest. All of the life in the, in the arid west evolved, and I'm going to get into that a little bit, to have fire nudge it, help it... Um, express itself to its truest potential. But we are dealing around the West as a whole with a different kind of fire animal than we have in the past. We're dealing often now with so-called megafires, for instance. Megafires are loosely defined as over 100,000 acres. Now, that used to be you know, not entirely unheard of, but it was a fairly rare phenomena. Certainly, the uh, Yellowstone fires of 1988 would have qualified for that, but it was not that common. Since the year 2000, we've had 12 years since the year 2000 where we've had over a dozen megafires. This is what fire, healthy fire, has looked like for thousands of years. It's a so-called stand maintenance fire. Now, those flames will be 5 to 8 to 10 feet tall. Temperatures of the flames will be about 1,400 degrees. That first fire you saw, the 416 fire, very different animal. 150-foot flames, 2,000, 2,200 degree temperatures. So because of that, you've got fires creating their own weather. You've got sometimes the risk, as we'll see, of fires sterilizing soil for a time, which makes them very subject to uh, slumping and debris slides and things like that. So just keep in mind that it's not just bigger and hotter and more of them. There have been 51,000 fires in the United States this summer. It's not just more of them, it's that they get bigger and they get hotter and those, that combination creates not only a change for the environment, but a real risk for firefighters. Um, Scott mentioned firefighters and how much more dangerous it is because of the wildland-urban interface development. Wildfires are, uh, wildfire fighters make up only 5% of professional firefighting uh, force in the United States and they have six times the mortality rate of other urban firefighters. This is dangerous, dangerous business, and it's getting more so all the time. Okay, so let's talk about what fire does that's good and why, as Scott said, we need to keep it on the landscape. In the arid west, the only way a so-called 
a unit of biomass, and that's just vegetation. A standing tree is biomass. Anything that's living vegetation or formerly living is considered biomass. The only reason, the way to get that biomass back into the soil, which means all the nutrients it contains, will f- give a flush to a new round of life, is through fire. We don't have the uh, microbial action that they do in the northeast or the northwest where it's wetter and logs decay. You know very well if you've hiked around here much that a log can fall and it can be there 50 or 60 years later. That doesn't happen in other parts of the country. The only way that gets returned to the soil and nutrientizes the soil is through fire. This is a shot of uh, Yellowstone uh, after 1988, in the spring, actually, of of, uh, 1989. Um, Fireweed and other sorts of forbs and grasses and vegetations were really coming back because that soil was now nutrient-rich, 30% richer in protein in a lot of what they studied in Yellowstone than it was before the fires. So that's a good thing. Elk get to graze a lot more successfully because the grasses are richer. Uh, the canopies of the trees open up, and that gives um, life to graze. There's all kinds of good things that happen. And because there are good things that happen with fire, we see plants and animals evolving with the maximum capacity of how to take advantage of what fire offers. This is a fire lily from South Africa. This is a shot nine days after the fire came through. It went from seed to this in nine days. Now that's a real tuned up plant as far as knowing how to take advantage of what the fire is offering. No competition from other vegetation, lots of nutrients in the soil. Serotonous pine cones in lodgepole pine. Some of you have heard this term. A percentage of most lodgepole pine trees have uh, serotonous cones, which means they only open up in the presence of fire. And oddly, and not so oddly, it's not really coincidental at all, it takes about 30 seconds of flame around this cone to open it up and then scatter the seeds, which is just about the time it takes a lodgepole tree to crown out with a flame fire in the top of the tree. So as soon as that fire moves through, there's fresh seeds on the ground, and that's why in Yellowstone, lodgepole pines were able to regenerate at a rate in the first few years of 100,000 trees an acre. It's absolutely astonishing. Again, evolving to take advantage of what fire can do. Ponderosa trees, the reason you don't see lower branches on them is so that it doesn't provide a ladder for fire to climb up into the crown of the tree and kill the tree. That's why Ponderosa also has such thick bark to protect that cambium layer when hot fire goes through. So again, lots and lots of things going on to take advantage of fire. This is what's called um, an epicurious uh, bud system in a in a tree in in uh, this shot was taken in California and what happens is there's a hormone produced by the tree that keeps buds from coming out of the side of the tree normally fire comes through hits this tree destroys the crown the hormone production stops and epicurious buds start coming out of the side and one of them will eventually be the new terminal bud of the tree. On and on and on it goes. Animals too have learned to do some pretty amazing things. Not to necessarily um, that they don't suffer occasionally from fire. Uh, In Yellowstone, there were about 250 to 300 elk that died out of many, many thousand. At that point, there were about 40,000 elk in the park. Um, But that was mostly from smoke inhalation. Flickers come back in droves after a fire because they know that there's going to be some good eating when the insect populations start to come around again. Brown falcon black kite, two Australian birds. This is amazing to me. This was just verified finally. It was long considered a folktale, but verified last year by scientists. These birds, fire is such a common thing in Australia. They've learned to fly into the edge of flames, pick up a burning stick, take it over to a part of the landscape that's not burning, drop it in the grass, light it on fire, and that causes all the little rodents to go scurrying out in front of the flames, and so they eat like it's, you know, just the biggest party ever. So lots of good adaptation. But again, Now we've got a different kind of fire going on, okay? We've got, even without mega fires, we've got hotter fires, and they are bigger. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Colorado this year has had 1,500 fires, 450 structures lost. 
um, a, a staggering amount of money, as Scott said, uh, trying to fight them. And of course, a lot of damage and heartache and anxiety, which is what I said when we started this conversation. Let's talk about why we've got such a heavy fuel load and why we got so enthused about putting out all the fires in the first place. This is the big burn from the early 20th century. The Forest Service was a very fledgling operation and Gifford Pinchot wanted to make sure Congress kept funding it. And so when this fire, which took uh, about 4 million acres out in northern Idaho, western Montana, eastern Washington. When that came through, Pinchot argued uh, to Congress that, hey, the Forest Service could become the firefighting agency and save this kind of lack of this loss of resource. Uh, it, was a, it was a great idea. The Congress, begrudgingly, they weren't into spending money back then any more than they are now, but had to agree that Pinchot had a point. And so the Forest Service very shortly after this came up with what was called the 9 a.m. rule. So any, any fire that started by 9 o'clock the next morning, it was supposed to be out. Now that's a pretty unrealistic goal, but nonetheless that gives you a sense of how excited we were to put fires out. This was a war against wildfire. And so there wasn't that understanding or that acceptance of, well, a little bit of this is probably good, but completely eliminating fire is not. That didn't show up for about 70 years. So 70 years we had fire suppression to the point that today we've got 300 million acres in the West that are heavily fuel loaded. 300 million acres. California's about 200 million acres. That's a lot of land with a lot of fuel load. So Forest Service for a while rented from Disney Bambi, and Bambi went around as the spokesperson, who, spokes deer, who would, uh, before movies started in movie houses, give a, f a friendly message about make sure that there are no fires burning when you leave your camp. That got replaced ultimately by this guy who you all know, wonderful bear, did a fabulous job when there was really a bear in the early 60s uh, that got his, uh, himself singed and hurt down in New Mexico in the Lincoln National Forest. They originally named him Hotfoot Teddy, and then the Forest Service realized that this could be a real smoky bear, and so he became that, went to the National Zoo, and he remained the most popular attraction at the National Zoo for decades. This is the most widely recognized recognized public symbol in the world to this day, Smokey Bear. So Smokey Bear has done a lot of good, but he did his job really, really well. And this is what we have. This is more of a Northwestern forest. And this is the kind of stuff we have. I've walked uh, thousands of miles around the Rockies, and when I come to blowdowns, uh, oh, that is just the most challenging. And the older I get, the more challenging it gets. But this is the kind of fuel load we've got going on right now. And somebody else may talk about this, but kiln-dried lumber is about 11%. If you go to Home Depot and buy lumber, it's about 11%. The, low, the, the down dead trees laying on the White River National Forest right now are coming in about 6%, 5%. You, you could burn a lumber yard and it would be more effort energetically to get that to burn than it is in a lot of the forests right now and not just in Colorado and other places too. And then we get to climate change. I only have one geeky slide, Al Gore-like slide, and, and this is it. And this just is really showing the difference between 1981 and 2010 as far as the amount of warmth and where it's happened. Of course, it's happened in the Northern Hemisphere because that's where a lot of the industrial production takes place around the world. The fire season has grown by more than 80 days since the late 1970s, by 80 days. Why? Because snowpacks are coming off earlier, that not only diminishes water available in the forest, but it also opens up the forest to the drying effects of the sun. Um, we've had three major drought periods lasting three to four years, and right now California just did a very comprehensive climate assessment, really rigorous, great science, some of the best science I've seen, and they're predicting now that they will probably have snowpack diminished uh, on the order of about 70% by 2050. That's a real serious snowpack diminishment. So this is what we're living in the middle of right now. The five hottest years on the planet have been uh, all since 2000, and the last four hottest years on the planet were 2014, 15, 16, and 17. So we are heating up. There's no question about it. And in one study that was able to tease out 
what was likely natural, like ocean circulation caused patterns for drought and increase in temperature. And this is not an exact science, but it's getting better and better all the time, and it's really quite good. The best guess was that since 85, human-caused climate change has been basically responsible for doubling the amount of acreage burned every year in the West. So it's a very, very real thing. As Scott said, it's here. It doesn't matter why you believe it's here, it's here. Uh, this is a shot, uh, again, uh, from California. You can see a diminishment from 14 and 15 in snowpack, but again, by 50, they're thinking 70% diminishment of snowpack in the Sierra and the other uh, ranges of California that, that now they depend on for, for water. So we get these drought conditions and these dry conditions. That opens up timber for s another critter you're probably way too familiar with in Colorado, and that's the pine bark beetle. In, in 2016, California lost 62 million conifer trees. A lot of them to this insect, not all of them. But what's happening is the increased temperature and the drought is stressing trees. This is a lodgepole pine, and you may have walked by lodgepole pines and seen these kind of pitch tubes on the side of it. That's the tree literally pitching out in invaders like the pine bark beetle. But what happens in a drought is it loses the moisture necessary to make the sap that creates the pitch out potential. So pine bark beetles have a much easier time in prolonged and protracted drought than they would otherwise. Um, in California in the Southwest, they're now saying that by the end of the century, they expect it to be a pretty strong 80% chance of 25 to 30 year drought periods. Um, that's a big deal, to say the least. This is uh, the west edge of uh, Yellowstone National Park, all pine bark beetle uh, kill on lodgepole forests. And of course, as you kill forests or lose forests to pine bark beetles, eventually five, six, seven, eight years, they'll stand dead and then they'll fall down and then we get that jumble of fuel load that we just talked about. Uh, one other thing we've had to really reconcile, uh, and that's uh, the spread of invasive uh, species, and in particular, cheatgrass, which now covers about 100 million acres of the West. Cheatgrass is like flash paper. It greens up really fast, and it goes brown, usually by the second or third week in June, depending on where you are. And from that point on, you can drop a match in cheatgrass, and it'll really look like a magician's flash paper. And so this is another situation that's carrying fire very quickly to places where it probably wouldn't have been carried with native vegetation. So as, as you may have heard, there's a big effort by the Forest Service, the BLM, and others, including the Park Service, to put a stop to cheatgrass spread. And I want to wrap things up with this wildland-urban interface uh, that Scott mentioned. This is where the action happens. Of course, the, the, the highest priority of a firefighting team is to keep, first of all, people, and then secondly, structures from damage. And um, so this is where a lot of the effort and a lot of the expense goes. 2.3 billion acres make up the United States. One billion acres are now wildland-urban interface. 120 million people are living in the wildland urban interface. 70,000 communities, and yet so far only 3% of those communities have done some very basic things that probably some of our other speakers are gonna talk about that protect communities from the worst ravages of wildfire. And if you don't believe that this works, uh, back in 2013 you may have may recall the uh, Black Forest Fire near Colorado Springs. In one subdivision that had not done any of these very simple tendings of individual homes and also of uh, the perimeter of the development, um, they lost 61 out of 65 homes. Right next door, Cathedral Pines had made fire proofing, if you will, or fire prevention, mediation, a priority. They lost four homes. It makes an unbelievable difference. And it's not rocket science. There's a lot of help out there to help communities do these things and individual homeowners as well. Um, so when, I'm, I'm not gonna get into much of this because you've got the experts who actually fight the fires right here in the front row and they can talk more about this. But anymore, given the conditions I've just described, when it comes time to get resources in, uh, uh, forest fire managers are really, 
I've heard it called ordering the moon. You know, they're trying to get everything they can as fast as they can so that they can put it out soon because given the kinds of conditions we're looking at, it's going to burn a lot more uh, quickly than it would have normally. So getting to it fairly quickly is important. And that often means uh, teams like these hot shots. Uh, talk about hard working I, I can't believe these people are burning about 700 calories an hour, six to 7,000 calories a day, cutting fire lines with chainsaws, and then there's a long line of uh, people that go behind them with Pulaski's and hose, getting soil down so it's bare, and then you might say, well, what does that matter, a six-foot strip or a three-foot strip of bare soil? Well, then a back burn is lit, uh, and that the, the fire usually creates such a draft, sucks the fire toward it, that it essentially burns out the fuel uh, in a way that allows the fire, hopefully, to not advance. And that's part of what building a fire line is, uh, is about. There's a lot of great technology now that wasn't around five or 10 years ago, too, including satellite imagery, uh, as long as we can keep funding it, to look and see what kind of fire activity is going on to keep those firefighters aware of an advancing front of those flames that may not be visible to anyone else, including lower flying aircraft, because they just can't see due to the smoke. So um, there's a lot going on to help firefighters not only be more efficient, but also to be safer as they, as they go into these more dangerous times. <clears throat> Fire retardant is colored red, so the drops can be seen. It contains mostly a lot of nitrogen, so it sort of can help actually uh, promote plant growth in the wake, but it doesn't stop fire, okay? It slows it down. Just like water drops with so-called Bambi buckets, where they put the buckets in a stream or a lake, and they drop the water usually directly on the flames, whereas the retardant is ahead of the flames. All of those are great, but they're to slow the fire down. They're not to put them out. As Scott, I think, mentioned, we can't put them out, okay? When they get to a certain level, we can't put them out. And that's real hard, I think, for us to accept. We are Americans, and we're clever, and we've got all kinds of firepower and air power and brilliance, but we can't necessarily put fires out when they get to a certain point. And so the, one of the reasons, again, being fuel load, especially meeting climate change, I wanted to just give a shout out because um, there, there are several folks here from the local fire departments. This is who protects the homes. Okay, Forest Service tends to not have, at least where I am up in Montana, the engine capacity to actually do a whole lot of structure protection. So it's the local fire departments that not only fight here, but sometimes get shipped all over the place with their engines to help fight. Now, one of the things that I would mention uh, on behalf of the safety of these people who are going in to try to fight these fires in housing developments, we need county commissioners that are committed to making sure that developments are done in an intelligent way. So that means not only maintaining a perimeter around yeah, the development that's not so flammable, it means not building houses closer than 30 feet apart so you have flash ignitions going from house to house to house. Um, it means having two ways in and out because a lot of fire departments are not going to send their people into a subdivision that's burning up if there's only one way in and out. What happens if that, if that one way isn't available anymore? They need to make sure, the county commissioners do, that there's an adequate water supply for fighting fires in that subdivision. Well, I mean, where's the water going to come from? Yeah, this, these engines will carry some, but not nearly enough to fight several houses burning. So we could stop the problem before it starts if new developments in the wildland urban interface had the simplest kinds of protections, using green belts uh, as fire zones and walking paths and parkways between the forest and the housing development. Lots and lots of creative people out there doing wonderful planning work. The Headwaters Institute in Bozeman, Montana is one of the best. Lots of free grant-funded support. They fly experts down and sit, sit down with communities and help them figure out, okay, how should we have our development regulations modified so that they're safer for everybody? Um, I want to get onto this really quick. Fire, when it gets big, like I talked about, especially mega fires, starts to create its own weather. 
And one of the most dangerous things it does is it creates its own wind. And this is a shot of a so-called fire whirl or fire tornado. This was from this year in California. Now you can look at that and see that one of the big issues with housing developments burning isn't necessarily a wall of flames, although sometimes it is, coming into the housing development. It's um, oftentimes pine cones and other sorts of burning debris spotting ahead of the fire. And these fire tornadoes are incredibly um, good at, at doing just that. And so this is why having housing that has been somewhat fire protected is so important. So, um, screen mesh on the, uh, on the uh, attic and the crawl space, entryways, gutters cleaned out, 10 foot perimeter of stuff not growing around the house. This is really easy stuff. But the reason is so that fires don't spot and drop a burning cone on, in your gutter and all of a sudden you and pretty soon the neighbors are, are up in smoke as well. Lots of technology being developed, uh, as I mentioned, satellites being used not only to uh, keep firefighters safe, but to kind of almost sense drought, where the drought is worst going into the fire season and thereby stage fire resources in appropriate places that are most likely to be troublesome if they do light up. Last thing I want to get into has to do with what happens in a super hot fire. I mentioned sometimes the, f the soil gets sterilized. This is a burned area emergency response team, and the Forest Service is really, really advancing in this area. They can, again, with satellite technology, decide which areas burn so hot that there's no no nutrition, no, it's been rendered sterile, and let's send people in here and do what we can to prevent these kinds of debris slides from uh, wreaking havoc. And this is becoming, especially as you know in California, a secondary problem that is just as dangerous and, and, and devastating to neighborhoods as sometimes the original fire was. When fire burns too hot, the vegetation essentially vaporizes and creates a hydrophobic soil. This is, uh, this is some of that soil. See how the water isn't soaking in, it just sits on top of it. So when hydrophobic soil is created from too hot of a fire, you've got a real recipe for a massive landslide and flooding downstream. They also have to look, as they learned from the Hayman fire back in 2002 in Colorado, that when fires burn really hot and big, and when they burn in old growth especially, they also release a lot of toxins. And I'm talking lead, cambium, mercury, arsenic, because old growth timber tends to hold those toxic chemicals in the tree. And when they all go up, that goes into the water supply. So now we're trying to figure out how to get ahead of protecting water supplies so that the people don't have to suffer from that. So this is a, a recent, not too long ago, not, it's a bit fuzzy, but this is a debris slide in California. This is what it looks like going down a, a, a main street. And this was from a half an inch of rain, okay? So it doesn't take a whole lot of water. This is what happens, and enormous size. So I am wrapping up now, and I want to thank you for letting me share a few of these thoughts. I know they were fast and furious, but this is an incredible panel of people in the front row here. If you have any questions tonight, they will, I'm sure, have lots of answers and thoughts. I wanted to just end by saying forests are so important, not just for our recreation, our health. They generate the oxygen we breathe. They also store about 30% of the excess carbon humans are uh, putting into the atmosphere right now. So figuring a way to have healthy forests is absolutely critical to that kind of long-term and often confusing issue of climate change. There's more than just beauty and recreation here. There's watersheds, there's oxygen, and there's carbon sequestration, which is going to help us not go down the drain with climate change in the years to come. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. Our next session is titled, Lake Christine, The View from the Front Lines. And you're going to hear from three people who are on the front line fighting the Lake Christine fire. And by the way, your program shows four speakers, and we had four speakers for this session, but Allie Richards, the East Zone Fire Management Officer for the Upper Colorado River Interagency Fire Management Unit that for the rest of this evening I shall call it UCR, uh, she called two hours ago to say that a new fire had broken out in her zone, and she's fighting it. Um, Allie told me to tell you specifically, and I quote, it is still fire season. 
Um, and she said that her east zone is seeing a new fire break out roughly every two days. We wish Allie good luck and may this next fire be a small one. We're delighted, however, that Scott Thompson, our next speaker, is with us. Scott is the Basalt Snowmass Fire Chief. Chief Thompson and his team were the first firefighters to confront the Lake Christine fire, and we owe him and his department a huge debt of thanks for their tremendous work. Welcome, Chief Thompson. Um, doesn't seem fair after following Scott and his words of wisdom and Gary and all his knowledge. Um, what I would really want to try to express to everyone is our first responders, our firefighters, our EMS and our police, they did an incredible job in the first 36 hours of the Lake Christine fire. <laughs> that being said, um, I wanna stress that we need to get on our soapboxes and start making our politicians <laughs> change our building codes change our codes in our subdivisions. Um, I had a little script written. Um, it's kind of out the door after the last two speakers. But um, we've, we've brought this up. We've challenged commissioners and city council to change some of the building codes and adopt some of the urban interface codes. Um, that's the only way we can be ready. Um, Gary brought up some simple things. I'm a true believer in hardening structures. Being ready, ready, set, go. Everybody's got their pack set. If you feel in danger, you leave your home. Um, and then you uh, sign up for pick and alert or whatever to uh, be ready to go. Those, those things um, I think are really the success story of the Lake Christine fire that people got out of the way. We had some hiccups. You know, we stressed to the land planners, we need 24 foot roads. And they're like, oh my God, they're huge. People get run over, they drive too fast. Well, guess what? JW Drive in Elgebel became a parking lot. We could not get fire trucks out of the fire station. There was people coming into the subdivision to get their stuff out and there were people trying to leave and the fire trucks trying to get in. Um, it was an ultimate quagmire. No one wanted to go to the roundabout. The roundabout was looked dangerous, and it was dangerous. So those are the lessons learned. Um, I truly believe that if we put some political pressure on our commissioners and our town councils, we can make changes in these subdivisions. Um, I've personally seen cedar fences cause fires in subdivisions. They collect the embers. They're connected to the houses. It's a simple thing to unconnect them and have a metal gate so they're not attached to the house. Um, Gary brought up um, the venting, you know, certain wire meshes. Um, the other thing, um, we have cedar shake roofs. They're still being installed. I drove down Aspen, in downtown Aspen the other day. They're not, you know, free from being in a wildfire zone downtown because the embers are gonna shed on them if there's a big enough fire. They're putting shake shingle roof in downtown Aspen. That's, it just doesn't make any sense. So somehow we need to get a movement started to try to change some of those things. And I think that that's the best thing we can do for our communities because these fires aren't gonna go away. Um, we did a great job of trying to stop this one um, it blew out. We had a couple of weather events. Um, you've all heard the stories. Um, but this is going to happen again. You know, we have a lot of areas ripe that are choked with oak brush, um, decadent, dying timber. Um, and uh, it's going to happen again. That's pretty much all I have to say until I get on the panel. But uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Scott, for sharing uh, um, some really important points that maybe we don't think about enough, uh, most of us, that is, about some s relatively simple things we can do, like talking to our elected officials and getting some building changes. 
Of course, it sounds simpler than it is, but it, it's a good place to start, um, and maybe not building those cedar fences. Um, Doug Cup, our next speaker, is the Greater Eagle Fire Chief. He played a decisive role in stopping the Lake Christine fire at one of its most threatening moments, which he will tell us about. Welcome, Chief Cup. It's hard to follow a segue of these great speakers, um, but I'm glad that they were able to lay a lot of groundwork for the message that I would like to talk about. Because we're gonna talk about the operations a little bit and the decisions that have to be made in a difficult situation. So I'm gonna use a quote from 500 BC from Sun Tzu who wrote The Art of War. And he would often say things that still stay true today. Like if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you should fear not the results of a thousand battles. We train our firefighters for a typical fire season. There are no more typical fire seasons. As our speakers told us today about there is, this is the new norm, that we have a fuels problem in America. We often are challenged with making decisions that normal people would think are absolutely crazy but we are training our firefighters to take on risks that they shouldn't have to. We're challenged with making a decision over a firefighter's life over property. These are things that do not sit well with me. I've had these challenges many times, and even though that the community wraps their arms around us that night of the 4th, and doing a crucial backfire operation to save, to save the town of El Jebel. I can guarantee you there are parents to those firefighters who do not like me. <laughs> I've put their firefighters, their sons and their daughters in harm's way for the greater good of what I thought was attainable that night. I don't like making those decisions, and people want to often know how it was that I made a decision that night in a matter of moments to make a crucial change. So we train our firefighters in this world. We train to something that we call the OODA loop. And this is from Boyd Aviation of a fire pilot who says, we're going to observe what we have going on. We're going to orient ourselves to this environment that we have. We're going to make a decision, and then we're going to act. And as soon as we act, we have to go back, we have to observe, did it work? This was the night of the fourth, is that when we saw the 100 to 200 foot flame links impinging on El Jebel, the best thing that I can say is that I had trust from a fire chief. I had trust from the operations chief that when I said, this is what we're gonna do, they said, okay. They knew that this was one of the only options to be able to save a town. We don't take this lightly because we know that we're gonna push our folks to the threshold. When we make a decision when there's no mitigation done between the fence line, the fuels, the homes, the home hardening that Chief Thompson was talking about is that often people want to relate to something called luck or that mother nature save this, or thank goodness there was a little bit of rain. That night, we were unlucky. No aircraft, we don't have that at night. We had a 50-foot weather event that slammed into that town and it was in our faces. Firefighters showed up not ready to fight wildland fire that day. They showed up for their shifts. We had to do an inventory of what we could do to actually do a firing operation. We were pulling road flares off of their vehicles that they would use for a vehicle accident to start a backfire. We did not have the tools and the equipment to do such event. We usually planned for these things for 12 hours. We planned for this one 20 minutes. So although the odds were against us, I wanna talk about something that we do in the fire service that I think we do well, but please don't push us to do it often. We call them opportunities. We used to use standard firefighting tactics for things. We would say, this is the way to do that. We're gonna scrape the earth away, we're gonna dig line, we're gonna remove these trees, we're gonna move that big tree next to that house. That takes time. So when we look at what we have up against us, we can say what's attainable, what's achievable, and what are the results we're going for? And then today's world, instead of saying we're gonna follow the standard, we're put into the situation called 
Let's look for an opportunity. Because an opportunity usually presents itself and doesn't present itself often, and you have to look for it and you have to take advantage of it. They don't occur very often, but when it is, you have to use that leadership to say, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna do it, are we ready to go? And that night, I had great leadership ahead of me that said, we're there with you, we're gonna support you. When we do fire by fire, and we set fires like that. Sometimes it's politically difficult. And we talked about the mitigation, we talked about fuels problems, policy changes, all of these things that need to happen. But also, think of the ramifications if that night did not go well, and they said, yeah, but Doug Cup's fire burned down 50 homes. The reason we were successful is we only lost two from that burnout, burnout operation. And only one more was lost from, from that night. And so think about the successes, but realize that we take great risks, not only politically, but with lives, to do such an operation when the opportunity is very small. We love those opportunities to present themselves, but we like them to have multiple opportunities to say we have options, we have a plan, we have time. But in these events where we have fuel that is continuous throughout that landscape, and you're looking at going, there's no stopping this fire. Absolutely not. So the only opportunity that we had was to put fire in our own terms. And that decision is tough, is that do we have the right skill sets to be able to do this? Do we have the right tools to do this? Do we have the right timing to do this? We typically wait for this moment where the weather is being created by the fire. It wants to consume oxygen. It wants to be, draw in that fire. And you wait for this nice little breeze to switch and suck right into the fire. With a 50 mile an hour flame right, or wind right in our face, that's not gonna happen. And so the timing that, that had to happen that night was difficult and we had to force an opportunity. We do not like to force that opportunity. We like to take advantage of it when it exists. So that was one of those difficult nights. But because we had great firefighters, great police officers and law enforcement, uh, Forest Service folks, BLM folks that were there to engage that, they had the skill sets, they had the training. I don't wanna say that it's luck, but because of the people that showed up that night, that was lucky. The reason they had those skills, that's not luck, is that they were able to take that opportunity, they were able to make decisions on the fly and be able to have positive outcomes. So my, my reach out to the public is, please don't make me do that again. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, to state the obvious, what he did on the night of July 4th was a hell of a gutsy call. Um, that was, for me, literally an example of leadership, literally under fire. And we appreciate your decision making and your timing. And I agree with the call. Let's not make him do that again anytime soon in this valley. Um, our final Lake Christine speaker is Tico Isaacson, the Central Zone Fire Management Officer for the UCR. Tico was the Lake Christine Fire Management Officer from the very beginning of the fire until just a couple of weeks ago, so he can give us a broad overview from start to finish. Welcome, Tico Isaacson. Hello, so uh, it is very challenging to follow uh, very powerful, um, knowledgeable speakers that we've had so far. Um, I'll try to go in a in a little bit uh, different path with Lake Christine. Um, you know, we had we started off um, with with it being one jurisdiction, but uh, it was right on the edge of three counties and different organizations and ownerships. And the response from the the fire um, the different fire organizations and law enforcement organizations to support that fire for, for Basalt Fire was, was outstanding, I think. And one of the reasons that uh, the resources were there for Doug to make great decisions and, and Chief Thompson to, to support that so that those houses were saved. Um, you know, we, we went through some scenarios in the spring where, you know, similar, not exactly the same, but, uh, you know, to try to get us prepared uh, for for the different uh, eventualities that might happen this summer. We knew that this summer could have been a big fire season. 
and that, that we needed to be prepared. We always prepare um, very well. Um, but the unified response uh, initially was, was really great. You know, we didn't have uh, a lot of stake but, um, at, at that time, but we had resources from the federal side, resources on the fire, and, and I, I was up there to, to try to support in any way I could. And, you know, they were, they were doing a great job. Um, during that time, we, and, and after that, um, we had a lot of success with, um, with slowing down the fire and getting and able to put in fire lines where we had done fuels treatments in the past. And so there, there is a lot of, a lot of good that came out of the past fuels treatments um, and a lot of good, um, a lot of good work that had been, been done in the past to slow down the fire. So after initial attack in those first 36 hours that were, that were really busy on the third and the fourth, uh, that happened, the big move on the fourth happened on a transition night. We were transitioning to a type two team the following morning. And so th that is one of the, th the times that we really have to be careful. Transitions are really dangerous for firefighters, change of command, all of those things. And the leadership that these guys showed was just outstanding. Um, after, after they took command, we had two different type two teams on this fire. It, we got some rain. Uh, it was held up. We moved to a type three organization. And that's how the ICS system works. Uh, it, we had the right amount of people for, for, the, for the fire activity on the ground and the potential. And so we moved down from a type two to a type three organization. And then once it started to move again, then we moved back up to a type two organization. And then we had, um, another type three organization follow the second type two team and then two type four ICs. And we had firefighters on the ground until about a week ago doing suppression, re or two weeks ago, doing suppression repair, um, s making things safe. We have um, just making sure that the fire wasn't gonna go anywhere. Um, it's been, it's been, a long process from July July 3rd uh, up on the Forest Service land. So even though you might not be seeing a lot of smoke, we had we had firefighters on the ground for uh, you know for almost three months. So um, I just wanted to. I had some other stuff, but uh, <laughs> but everybody really hit on that stuff, and I think that we're going to be able to cover some of the some of the what we can do in the future. Um, in the panel. So, thank you. Thank you, Tico, for your long, hard work on the Lake Christine fire, um, for creating those fire lines and the ongoing fire suppression efforts that went on for those, as he said, almost three months. So our final session this evening will be a panel discussion of what's in our future, how can we prepare. I'd like now to invite our panelists, Gary Ferguson, Scott Thompson, Tico Isaacson, and Jim Janung, to all please join me on stage. You already know Gary Scott and Tico, and joining them is Jim Janung, sitting next to me, the Central Zone Fuel Specialist for the UCR. And Jim, thank you for joining us, and let me start with you. Can you tell us briefly what fuel management, what the term means, and the relationship between fuel reduction and wildfire, which has been referred to several times tonight? Okay, so, it the easiest way to, for me to explain to the public that type of uh, what, what fuels are, fuels is anything that's burned, anything that's combustible out in the, in the wildlands. Um, reducing fuels and, and its relationship to fire, if you just, it, it's very simple. It's, it's a campfire. You want more fuel, you put more wood on. You want a smaller fire, take some stuff out of there. So you want a smaller fire around your house, you take the stuff out from around your house there. That's, that's the, the simplest way to put it. Um, you know, reducing fuels is removing any wildland uh, 
um, vegetation, uh, timber, you know, a anything of, of that nature that's going to burn, that's going to affect your house or your neighborhood or your your village. Okay. And do you could you just comment a little bit more about techniques? Okay, so techniques we've been using, um, and uh, the first prescribed fire on the White River National Forest was uh, in 1977, I believe, and that was uh, actually, I think, right up on Basalt Mountain, near Basalt Mountain, uh, I think it just uh, north of the, the big parking lot up there. Um, you know, so we use fire to reduce the hazardous fuels, uh, you know, quieter times of the year, cooler times of the year, wetter times of the year, we use fire to reduce fuels on the landscape. That's one of our biggest tools. Uh, you know, closer to homes, chainsaws, rakes, uh, you know, um, anything you can do um, to, to reduce those kinds of fuels around your house with, with the tools you have in your garage. And then on the landscape scale, uh, we use all kinds of, of large, large equipments, um, mulchers, things like that. Uh, feller bunchers, uh, whatever we can do to get that fuel and get it out of there or get it down on the ground, uh, reducing the aerial, uh, aerial hazard that's, that's, that's driving a wildland fire and, and get those fuel either on the ground or uh, remove the fuel. Thanks. Thanks. Tico, can you comment on your own view on how at risk are our communities? I mean, in this immediate region, how defensible are our neighborhoods and our assets like High power lines in the wild urban interface. Uh, sure, it, I think that's really dependent on the individual communities. There have been uh, a lot. Of, there's been a lot of work, like around Canyon Creek Estates and some of the other communities that, you know, that that significantly reduces the. Um, you can never take away the risk, but uh, significantly reduces the chances of wildfire impingement and more importantly it gives firefighters a chance to go in there and protect those homes those uh, those values at risk and so it's very dependent on what private landowners have have done around their land it's also very dependent on what uh, various jurisdictions uh, Forest Service, BLM have, have done on those lands. And generally, there's, you know, where there's the best success is where multiple owners, where there's uh, cross, cross ownership, uh, you know, close, closely, um, where, you, where you see the most success is where people are doing projects together to reduce those fuels around, around those structures. So where, where there's been work done, then, then I think we have some places that are in really good shape. And then where there hasn't been work done or there isn't the knowledge that, uh, that we do need to reduce those fuels, uh, then, then there are quite a few places that are also at risk right now. Thanks. Um, Gary, back in, back in August, an Aspen newspaper uh, ran a headline with the words, is this the new normal? What's your take on that? Are we in store for hotter and hotter and bigger and bigger wildfires? Where do you think things are going? I think generally, yes, this is the new normal. That doesn't mean there won't be some years when we get a reprieve or even a couple, three years in a row. But generally, and, and this, is, this isn't my opinion, this is the opinion of some of, I think, the most respected and well-anchored men and women who are doing research on climate modeling uh, and integrating them with the resources, what the state of the forest is, uh, what the activity of uh, insects like pine bark beetles. Th there will be bigger droughts, longer droughts, there will be warmer temperatures, and of course, every degree the temperature goes up, the humidity goes down in the arid west. So the hotter we are, the lower the humidity. That makes the fuel loads uh, out there a lot more flammable and, and, and likely to spread fire. So th on one hand, I think that's that apparently pessimistic view is something we need to breathe into and um, maybe grieve, uh, mourn a little. But there's an awful lot, as we've been talking about, that can be done to 
improve the forest through treatment of the forest itself and certainly to safeguard our communities. We've really just barely started, especially the latter um, uh, business of, of protecting our communities. And I don't know if Scott would have any thoughts on it, but it's been my opinion too that the way firefighting is funded, especially through the Forest Service, the Forest Service is exceedingly using the vast majority of its dollars to fight fire. You know, you put the fire out, but for the dollars that are necessary for treating the forest to make future fires less problematic, that money is getting pretty hard to come by. So to have some kind of FEMA equivalent, basically, on a federal level that would allow proactive work to take place would, I think, be a way, again, not to diminish the fact that we're going to have bigger, hotter fires, but to suffer less in the face of those fires. Thanks. Uh, Scott, a lot of people are asking the question, you know, how do we better prepare for the next fire? And you talked about things, important things, like changing our zoning codes. Can you go on a little further with those thoughts? I mean, what do individuals need to do um, with their houses? And, you, and you've already mentioned some. The fact that, you know, we don't really need cedar roofs anymore after watching, at least if you've got a house in the wild urban interface, and there are not many houses around here that aren't in the wild urban interface. So what, what else can we do? What should people be thinking about? Well, I stress no matter where you're at, it doesn't matter if you live in Soper's Village or Blue Lake. Um, lessen the fuels in your yard. Um, I already made mention of that fence, but Old Town Basalt. Um, if you look at the fuel loading when you drive through Old Town Basalt, th those fuel loads are what spread the fire from building to building. Um, not to mention that the ember showers that get caught in the in the eaves that we've talked about and uh, in the attics and things like that. But everybody's got dead or dying fuels on their property, needs to deal with those. They um, lessen the fuels, 10 foot spacing in the trees if you have acreage. Um, all those things give firefighters the opportunity to suppress a fire. If the fuel loading is too much, we go on to the next property. You don't want us to go on to the next property. So we're, we're more than happy to come out to your property, give you a detailed description of what you need to fix. Um, and some of the stuff is simple. We don't want to clear cut your property. We want to make your property look like a park. And we want it to be inviting so the firefighters feel comfortable fighting fire on your property. Well put. Um, this is for any of you. Can a community learn to talk about managing the wild and urban interface for wildfire mitigation and for that matter for wildlife habitat when a lot of fear still exists in the public about fire and smoke impacts and mechanical thinning isn't all that popular either with a lot of people how do we change that dialogue or what do you what do you think about that any of you Well, I think we just had a, a perfect example of that. I mean, if you didn't see that coming, um, you know, and, you know, there's more coming. And, you know, I, I, you mentioned the smoke impacts. Um, I think that was probably one thing for sure that people weren't ready for. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've tried to stress that as, as something that, that's going to affect people, whether that fire is close or, or not close, you know. Um, could be two, three hundred miles away. We're getting smoke impacts, um, but readying a community for uh, for a wildland fire and and you know trying to get them to to do something is is difficult. I mean, it's really difficult. And and you know what Scott said is, and, and I, I've I've seen people leave notes on their house. Please, I know I didn't. Do the right thing. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't cut the trees down. And will you, please, anyway. will you please come in and, and do something for my house? You know, no, we're not going to do that. You know, um, you know, Doug. Doug put a lot of risk on some on some folks um, that night, and you know, but he saw an opportunity, and and the opportunity needs to happen. Um, you know, now, years before, not not you know, in the thirty seconds that. Doug Cup had to, to make a move up there, you know, um, 
uh, there's a term used, and if, if uh, stop me if, I, if I'm going on too, far, too much, but, you know, uh, and uh, somebody in this room has used this term before, I've heard him say it, um, communities that don't mitigate together burn together. And, you know, we talked about, you know, if houses are close, you know, it becomes an urban conflagration more than just a wildland conflagration. Um, you know, neighbors burn other neighbors' house down because they weren't, you know, prepared, and maybe one house is prepared. Um, the other isn't. Um, you know, building codes. Um, we talked about government um, changing building codes. Um, you know, there's lots of things, and we're we're working with. Um, you know, we work with the BLM, we work with the state, we work with the county on the Forest Service side to 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 try to expand these projects to bigger than just you know right to the the federal fence line. You know. Um, there's some actually some landowners now, large large landowners up in the, the Cattle Creek area that are that are interested in maybe expanding on some of the projects we're doing, um, either on Basalt Mountain or in Cattle Creek and further on up the road up there to the north that that want to um, expand on some, maybe some uh, fuels reduction and some wildland or uh, some some prescribed fire, um, you know. But trying to get these communities, other than seeing what's what's actually happening. You know, seeing it happen, I, I, I'm guessing more people are going to be interested at this point. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there that night, and I was receiving texts from folks wondering what they could do to do something around their house, you know, even though they lived 30, 40 miles away from the fire. Um, that's too late. You know, the night of the fire is too late. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not that person. I, I try. We all try, you know. Chief, I know, goes door to door in the neighborhoods in his fire protection district to try to influence people to 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 do something. And uh, I think we're getting there, but the worse it gets, you know, you know, maybe we'll get some folks to to turn around. So just to kind of echo Jim, um, before this season started, we knew we were in trouble after the winter. As we brought it, came into the wildland season. We held a forum at the high, or at the uh, library. Um, six people showed up. Um, that's hopefully this fire, um, the change in our landscape will change some of those attitudes for more people to come and get that information or request um, information to uh, make our property safer. Um, I'm no different. Since the fire, I've done a lot of things on my property. Um, so this fire scared me personally. Um, there, there's the old, do we use a carrot or a stick? I think, I think we use both. Um, carrots might be insurance companies giving reduction of rates for anyone who takes proper mediation steps around their homes instead of just jacking up the rates in a given area to the point nobody can afford it anymore. Um, and then on the stick side, you know, there's uh, not only increased insurance, but w with invasive weeds in a lot of the West, if you don't take care of them, then somebody is assigned by the city government or the county government to go in and take care of them for you, and you get the bill. And and that's a, that's a, a makes us wince as as kind of libertarian Westerners. But the fact is, this isn't this isn't anything to play around with anymore. This is. This is asking people to put their lives on the line. And yes, of course, it's property loss a risk too, but it's your neighbor's house, as, as Jim was saying, that, that could end up being lost. And it's the firefighters who could easily be injured or killed. The, the last stick I would say is w when I've been in different parts of the country, increasingly I hear folks from, say, the Northeast or the Northwest who, where, where moisture is much more handy say, well, why should, in a federal agency like the Forest Service, the tax dollars be paying for fighting fires in the arid west in communities where the developers and the developments and the county commissioners didn't insist on doing those things right? There's millions and millions, billions of dollars going out in federal tax money, and so there's a little bit of a, a, a fire, if you will, going on with some people saying, if counties don't do these kinds of things and require this to be done, then more of the fire suppression efforts, as far as what are provided by the federal uh, agencies, will fall on the county government. And I guarantee you that's a stick that's going to work. 
uh, I, I would hope that that would not have to come to that. But those are the kinds of things I hear, um, the kinds of grumblings I hear going on in, in different parts of the country. And there's, that's an interesting argument. You know, it, it really does have some validity to it. I think. Some of the area around Elgebel had been thinned, um, I don't know, eight or 10 years earlier. Uh, can one of you, and I, I think, Chief, you've talked about this, that if I'm remembering correctly, that the fire did, in fact, behave in a different way in that area. Somebody else referred to it tonight. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, there was a small portion where the two homes were lost um, that adjoined private property into uh, the Crawford property. Um, and then there was a strip of BLM that I don't remember, Jim, you um, might, but 2004, 2005, um, we actually went in there and did, it was mainly by hand, um, chainsaws, um, did uh, put the debris back on the ground, um, spaced the trees 10 feet, got rid of the dead ladder fuels, things like that, which I truly believe had a little bit of impact on slowing that fire down and making the backfire a little bit more successful just because there was less fuels. Um, but that should be one of the success stories going out of this that we don't want to lose those opportunities to be able to do that in other subdivisions or around other subdivisions. And if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the two houses that were lost in that area were, were against, up against the area that had not been. Then, yeah, they which took, doesn't prove anything, but it is yeah. suggests they, they it's took, not a bad Unfortunately, idea. the full brunt of the Pinion Juniper fire, um, and the firefighters didn't have good access. Um, I'm a proponent, like mo many of the other fire chiefs, I do not believe in putting a firefighter in danger in front of personal property. As long as we've saved the life and got the people out of there, let the let the property burn. Um, we don't ever want to lose a, a firefighter. Um, I've heard it said by uh, forest experts that in the future, forests are going to look different. Our forests are going to look different than they do today. Could I any one of you comment on that? I mean, is that good or bad? Go ahead. I'm not a forest expert. But yeah, yeah, you are tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, th that's a tough Tough question, really. I mean, um, is the forest going to look different? I've heard people say we should start, uh, you know, as we as we have fires and we have things happen on the forest here, we should start planting ponderosa pine hmm. as a drier climate species. To I don't I don't I'm not buying into that because I've also heard that as the temperature warms, the monsoon will uh, become stronger. Mm -hmm. um, so do we become do we start planting cedars then? Or, you know, has it become rainforest or what? Right. You know, so I don't know that. I don't know, um, you know, I think, you know, our our typical um, stand replacing fire in our forest, when you talk about forest, I'm talking about spruce fir, we're talking about high alpine, subalpine um, fir, um, spruce, dug fir, the stuff we have, um, you know, above eight, 9,000 feet that that typically burns on an on an average you know naturally over a it has a natural fire cycle of about 250 years right so right. we come down into the 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 places where we live in the in the um pinion juniper in the brush and that's where the real problem is and um i'm not sure what that's going to look like i don't know all right fair enough i can't i can only see to to the prescribed fire we're going to do next spring yep <laughs> Or there maybe are, this fall, if we get some moisture. There are some parts of New Mexico now that uh, they're starting to see the forest actually diminishing and it being replaced by more of a Mediterranean shrub sort of climate. So drought and temperature increases down there, not so much here, are having that effect. Uh, Aspen uh, in Colorado and elsewhere are being stressed uh, by drought. And so it's quite likely, I think, over time, they'll become more vulnerable to uh, infestations. So we could lose... Aspen, um, you know, those older stands. So I think it's, to, from what I've heard, um, it's, it's a climate-driven change. And the fact that if a fire burns either frequently enough through an area or hot enough, there will be an elimination of what the typical vegetation was and it may be replaced by um, shorter-term shrubs 
uh, uh, Live Oak and things like that than, than, it, than were there originally. So I think there will probably be some changes. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, inevitably forest systems are going to change, especially if climate changes. Uh, forest systems will change, uh, and it depends on the disturbance interval. If we have, if we have more fires go through an area, then, then it it will change. Um, you know, we have some really fire dependent uh, tree species here, like aspen. You mentioned aspen. Um, aspen's totally is is very dependent on a disturbance interval, whether that is an avalanche, whether it's uh, cutting it down, whether it's the most common is fire. And so what, what happens there is spruce fir generally starts to come in and become co-dominant with aspen, and then a fire is able to burn through that area, and then you have, similar to the lodgepole pine, you know, five to 10,000 uh, suckering aspen, and then, you know, 20 years later, you have a full nice aspen, 20 to 40 years later, you have a full nice aspen patch. I think inevitably forest systems are gonna change. Uh, and, you know, with the right treatments, then then it's a good thing. Uh, you know, there there can be some changes that, that would be detrimental with hydrophobic soils and things of that nature. Thanks. Um, we Let's open this up to the audience, um, questions from any of you for any of us on stage? When we have uh, homeowner participation, we may have codes that are enforced um, or implemented that create either fire breaks or sometimes what we call shadow breaks, um, something that could slow the fire. We look at those as opportunities to be able to tie into what has already been done. So sometimes we tie in, when we do a firing operation like that, we can tie into uh, a bike path that is in a perfect location around a town because people like to travel on those. A recreational bike path can become a strategy for us to be able to tie in and be able to create a buffer or a wider path. So we have these standards that would say, you know, for uh, one and a half times the fuel height is what we need to create a fire line so it doesn't jump it. So sometimes we look at that as a road. As Chief Thompson was talking about, a wider road can actually create as a buffer. And if I was to do a firing operation off of that, I've created now a, a wider buffer. So this is what I talk about when we say opportunities. An opportunity exists either because we have a weather event that is a spur of the moment that I can capitalize on. Sometimes it is a homeowner that has done really good mitigation and we don't have to do much preparation work. We can actually use their land as that kind of buffer, that kind of fuel break that we need uh, to tie things in for us. So when we make a decision, we have to look at what do we already have on the ground because we often cannot change many things that we cannot change the topography. We cannot change the slope, and we cannot change the current location of where someone built a house. What we can change is what the fuel is. That's the one thing that we can change, because I can't change the weather either. So again, when we have to make a decision going, what we call the causal chain of effects, is that they're all links in a chain, and that the weather, the fuels, <laughs> Um, the topography all make that fire behavior happen, and we try to understand that as science. It's not the angry dragon, and it's not this mythical thing we talk about. It's science. So when we look for an opportunity, we say, what is it that exists that we can capitalize on and will work? So we try to break that chain to say that here's the weather, here's the topography, here's where the house is, here's the slope. Where can I take the link out? Nine times out of 10, that's fuel. So we're either gonna dig the fuel away down to mineral soil where it can't burn. Sometimes we have to do a firing operation. So when we look at going, what kind of time we have, that opportunity may not exist. In Elgebel, I would have loved to be able to put a firefighter with just a drip torch walking through the fuel and doing a nice little line. We didn't have that. It was too dangerous to put firefighters in harm's way. As Chief Thompson was talking about, we don't ever want to have to make that decision to put firefighters in the way of property. 
So that would have been really dangerous. I would have really had some parents really upset with me what the dangers I would have put their firefighters, their sons and their daughters into. So we had to take an opportunity with other opportunities. We used a very pistol, which is a flare gun. So some of the people have seen the video of us shooting that. Of course, the police didn't like that because they thought the people were firing rounds and ammunition. Um, other people thought that uh, people were trapped and doing signals. Uh, so I didn't do a good job communicating that night of uh, what we were doing. But those were last resorts. And so I know I'm rambling a little bit, but hopefully that kind of helps Cheap. with sometimes those opportunities really become narrow, and we don't like that. We like lots of opportunities. We go to the hood of the truck. We talk. We say, hey, what do you think is going to happen if we do this? Uh, that's not going to work. So the big decision Chief. was the backfire. The big decision was the backfire. And Chief, Chief yeah. Cup and Chief Thompson, could you two talk a little about this photo, which is now on the screen? Because that is so dramatic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you're looking um, to, the, to your left of the screen, um, I was actually driving down that highway coming off the fire line that night, and we were witnessing the, uh, the flame front that was impinging right onto that. If I may, for anybody who doesn't know, that's Elgebel on the right side of that slide, and that's the fire on the left side. And you might ask, why is there such a nice, neat, straight line between the two? I think I had a surveyor on the crew that night. <laughs> Uh, we get asked that a lot of, uh, you know, how do we create such a straight line uh, with, with that? And really what it comes down to is the, you know, the flame front is impinging onto the subdivision. And when we're talking about opportunities, and I mentioned trigger points, is that our trigger point that night was if we were to lose a home, I was going to pull all the firefighters out. Because now we're dealing with toxic gases off of homes that are made of plastics and metals and uh, carcinogens and cars and tires would be burning. And our lungs cannot take that. A home can. And that was going to be my trigger is that immediately if we were to start to lose homes, I was calling it. So I was pushing everyone really hard that night, don't let a home go because then we're all going. Um, so that was the end of the night was when we lost the two that we knew were going to be a, a problem for us that night. So um, it was a three-stage approach, uh, and that's why this line kind of exists, is that we were able to use uh, a very pistol. So when the, when the flame front, actually, we could actually see it. We saw a glow for a long time, and I said, you have to wait until we actually see it. Then they would uh, use the very pistol and create little uh, spot fires, and they grow together, which keeps the intensity down. So that was what would help with a fuel break is that it would kind of slow that fire from slamming into us. So the human body would never be able to take the kind of flame front we're going to get. After 200 degrees, you get pulmonary edema, um, and our, our lungs would not be able to survive that. So we would not be able to take that frontal force like that. And it's actually written, never take a frontal assault of a fire. And then this is what we were doing. So we had to put the fire in our terms. So what we did was is that we created these small spot fires that would be small, versus taking the brunt of something that was 100 foot flame lengths. Then we were to use um, what we would call hand throws, and this we were using road flares. We like to actually have a special tool for that. Uh, we didn't have that, and so we were throwing them. And that creates more spot fires, and they grow together, and the fuel burns away, so there's nothing else for it to burn. It burn as soon as it burned into another fire, it would just kind of fizzle out. So timing, obviously, is really important. Is that you have to get it done before the major fire hits but you can't do it too quickly or else you're gonna lose your own fire and it causes your own problem. So then as that, our own fire was starting to move towards us, we would use a hose line off of the fire engines to wet down the fuel so that it wasn't ready to burn, but it has to happen within minutes because that water just runs off. It's not gonna really hold. So that water line is that straight line. That's about as far as the water would spray off of the fire engines that would stop our own fire from coming towards us and make sure it was moving away from us. So that's why there's a nice straight line. It's extraordinary. And by the way, I'm going to credit this photograph to the gentleman sitting next to me. You took this, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Jim Janot is the The, the one thing to note, when you walk that line, it's not that straight. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it, it's, it goes back and forth, but, you know, it's definitely, you know, most of us that have been in the fire service, we've never seen that delineation like that, unless it's like um, Chief Cup says, we're burning off of a road, and then it's a straight line. Um, we hardly ever burn in the fuels, and that's exactly what they did that night. They burned in the fuels. The other thing you got to remember, a lot of those properties, those homes in the trailer park were irrigated. So that gave us a little bit of a break. And the wind was in your face like 40 miles an hour? Is that what I remember or something like that? Yes, throughout yeah. most of the night we were getting, um, we were getting about 40 mile an hour winds um, when we first started the firing operation. We had a little lull for a couple hours, and then we had another wind event that really started hammering us, um, you know, about two or three o'clock in the morning, which is when we lost the two homes, and they ended up getting the frontal assault of uh, a downwind that really, I mean, it just funneled right towards the two, and that was, you know, some of our toughest battles. So you're battle. throwing flares into a fierce wind with a big fire coming right at This is a gutsy thing. I'm gonna repeat my words. <laughs> Yeah, what could go wrong, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I would have liked to have uh, figured out who to blame if it didn't go right, right? Um, so the other thing that we're kind of missing out on, Blue Creek Trail and above where we lost the firefighter's house, there was a lot of effort by individual firefighters with their fire engines that worked until 5, 6 a.m. Um, to suppress those fires. And we're not making big news of that, but a lot of those properties were mitigated, and that's why we were successful in stopping those fires. Because those fires, that fire came up that hill in that oak brush, and most of the firefighters are saying, you know, 50 to 75 foot flames. So no air support, no back burn. Um, what was the success? The success was mitigation and great firefighting efforts. This strip is BLM property. This is where the mitigation, and right about here, there's the tree farm property. That is where it turns to private. So this area was where we did the mitigation and whoops. So it's the same thing that we'd wanna do mitigation. If we space out those trees and we get rid of all the dead fuels, it gives firefighters a chance to suppress the fire. Um, no, we don't want clear cuts. Um, and, and part of the reason the clear cuts are then you end up with some invasive species and different things like that. So it's detrimental. Um, not, okay, well, I'm not an expert in that, but the, the, the political side of creating a you know, clear cut um, is not the uh, fight I wanna make. The fight I want to make is making it so the firefighters can suppress it. So you Good ask, job, if, is there still a risk? My biggest fear was a fire was going to start off of Highway 82, you know, mile 20 across from Whole Foods and burn toward basalt. That's still a great possibility. Yeah, you've still got a strip of land um, to the south. This stuff that's burned is, like I said, it, that's done. It's mitigated. Um, and, you know, but there's a, a million acres out here still that's that needs work and, you know, around everybody's homes and everybody's community. And um, where Scott's talking about is still a, a risk past, you know, the lake there. Um, the, the stuff that didn't burn, uh, there's still a risk there. And, uh, you know, but it's just a testament to, you know, it, it, it helped Doug make a decision. Um, we talk about the Buffalo Fire. I mean, incredible. That, that just blew my mind that we could do what we did there in one afternoon, saving a billion dollars worth of real estate um, because of the work that was done. And something we talk about a lot is fire regimes, you know, and we start to nerd out, you know, fire people really like to nerd out on stuff. And I think being called a nerd is a good thing in today's world. Uh, but we talk about fire regimes and how often fires are supposed to naturally occur. And so when you're looking at this type of forest, and I haven't spent, done a lot of work on this, but I'm predicting it's probably 35 to 50 years is when you're supposed to have fires in the valley floors, oak brush, sage, cheatgrass, all those types of things. And so you have more fires 
hopefully less uh, extensive, less catastrophic like this. And when we hold off for so long, they become catastrophic because those fuels are ready to, to burn. And then you deal with the alpine forests of subalpine fir, things like that. You're talking 100, 200, sometimes 400 years is the natural cycle for it to burn. So if you're thinking about an area that just burned, within 20 to 30 years, this area would be naturally ready to go again. So it is no time. And then that's, that's humans, is that it's nothing bad has happened lately. Um, and we let our guard down. But the reality is, is that your children and, um, you know, grandchildren and, and those individuals will have to deal with this forest coming back. So what a great time to start planning ahead. Um, so if you're uh, kind of looking in the middle of the picture, I had uh, what we call two task force leaders that had uh, a large group of personnel working for them. And uh, the one that uh, would be at the bottom of the picture they were supposed to start their firing operation first because it's slightly downhill. If we started a fire um, at the lower, at the upper part of the picture, um, or the lower part of the subdivision, it would have sent fire up to them and would have endangered them. So we had to wait for them to start first. And what happened with that fuel break is we had a spot fire that jumped um, really close into the subdivision, which did not allow that, um, that other task force leader to start theirs, but the spot fire actually was doing what I was wanting them to do. It started to work downhill and it created a buffer to where that fire, that fuel was burned out. So I would not end up sending fire to them. And that's when we decided we need to go ahead and light or we're gonna lose all of our opportunities. And, uh, and that, was, that was some of the leadership I was talking about. When we have two leaders that were running the real tactics, you know, I just kind of point some fingers and I come up with these crazy ideas and then they make it happen and they were the ones making that happen, orchestrating it together and uh, very proud of them for being able to do that. So we almost started in the middle of the subdivision, but that was only because we were reacting to the spot fire that occurred. Uh, I would have rather have done it how we wanted to, uh, but we were just adjusting as we needed to. We have to close, but please um, thank you all for being here again and join me in a rousing round of applause for this panel. <laughs> and, and Valerie. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanna say thank you once again to our panel and presenters. Another round of applause, please. And also to let you know that Gary Ferguson will be signing, uh, selling and signing books. He'll be actually over here in the corner if you'd like to visit with him. And also a big thank you to the Arts camp at, Campus at Willits and hosting us at the Temporary this evening. So thank you all very much and have a good night.